with. I uh, switched over to an illustration major before I left. I spent a short time working in the uh, uh, special effects industry in Hollywood and uh, then left that uh, job to work in the defense industry for General Dynamics. Uh, spent some time working there as a conceptual artist and designer illustrating weapon systems and then after a couple of years left that facility and began freelancing throughout the defense and aerospace industry. So that was where it all started. In the early to mid 1980s, Mark's career as an aeronautical and technical illustrator began taking off as he accumulated a client list including the US Air Force, Rockwell International, Lockheed Martin, Boeing and respected periodicals such as Popular Science Magazine. He became well versed in conceptual design at the highest levels of the US military, industrial and aerospace programs and often called upon to generate classified and highly proprietary material. At the time, this was around 1985-1986, and uh, I had uh, been freelancing for about four years at that point. Done a lot of work for Lockheed, a lot of work for Rockwell, a little bit of work for Boeing. And uh, so I was establishing a reputation and, and uh, had occasion to talk to an awful lot of experts in the field, in various parts of the aerospace industry, so I had an idea of what was going on in terms of the technological development that was occurring in the industry at the time. Worked on uh, some conceptual artwork showing cutaways of some of the weapon systems and how the components inside those weapon systems interrelated to one another. I was given a lot of information. Many times I was asked to create illustrations for clients based on just verbal descriptions of what they wanted to see because a lot of it was conceptual artwork that was supposed to put across the idea that say a particular aircraft that they were designing was going to be extremely fast so it had to have all the sort of dynamic characteristics of what a really fast aircraft would have and I had an idea of what these things looked like so I was subscribing to some of the trade publications that were available at that time like uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology and a lot of people at the magazines, test pilots, editors and things. By the mid-1980s, he was a very successful professional artist living in Rialto, California. He had a full slate of high-profile projects and had become a very sought-after and respected talent in a very crowded field of designers and artists. Despite living in the era of Reagan and disco, things were going very well for Mark. Then, in the autumn of 1988, things took a turn for the weird. Well, it turns out that this was in uh, October uh, that the magazine hit the newsstand. It was a November issue of Popular Science. It was called the Mach 5 Spy Plane. And a friend of mine from college, Brad, had seen this um, cover illustration and, and opened up to read the story. He recognized my name and he called the art director. He passed along my phone number and the next thing you know, I get a phone call and this fellow calls up and says, Hi, Mark, it's Brad and remember me. And he said, yeah, we were in the transportation design curriculum at the Art Center in Pasadena when we uh, mm -hmm. studied car design. So, um, we got reacquainted, had lunch together, and it turned out that just a few weeks beyond that, um, the uh, a local Air Force Base, Norton Air Force Base, was having a big air show. And there was a, a rumor that uh, they were going to have a, uh, an SR-71 Blackbird out there, which was still kind of a rare occurrence uh, at air shows to see something like that. And so I uh, uh, invited Brad to uh, come out to the air show. and. Uh, he suggested that he might be bringing along a, uh, a client that he was working with. He didn't say who it was at the time, um, but that uh, he thought that there might be the possibility that we could network some jobs together. So uh, we arranged to uh, meet together, and at the last minute, um, I got a second call from Popular Science to do yet another illustration. It was a quick turnaround. They wanted it done over the weekend. It was a quick, you know, three thousand bucks. So I could turn that down. And, it was for their February of 89 uh, edition, uh, with the cover story being about the X-31, uh, which was an experimental aircraft program. So, uh, did that illustration, and uh, Brad went ahead and went to the air show, 
And um, when the uh, when the weekend was over, I was kind of interested in his impression, and I called him up and I just said, you know, how did you like the year show? And he, he just he just seemed completely different. When I talked to him on the phone, he sounded um, almost depressed. I mean, it was kind of a strange sort of reaction, and he said. Um, well, I don't know. I, I, I think I saw something I wasn't supposed to see. And I said, well, how's that possible? Everything that's at the air show is sent there and flown there with the intent of putting it on static display, especially for the public. So how could you possibly see something that wasn't intended to be seen? He says, well, he says, uh, I uh, got in to see a display that was you know, a little more exclusive. It was something that was set aside for some top military brass and some top politicians with clearances, and, and the fellow I was with didn't realize at the time that certain, you know, items were going to be on display, and as soon as he realized that here I was without clearance to see this stuff, you know, he basically said, you know, don't say anything, don't talk to anybody, we'll get out of here as soon as we can. Uh, so I, I asked him, I said, well, so what did you see that you think is so stunningly, you know, classified that, you know, you'd be in trouble? Well, he says, uh, uh, there was a, uh, an example of the first generation of Aurora there, which was the aircraft that was the actual second generation aircraft that I did the conceptual artwork for. So he saw the real thing. And so, of course, I was real curious about what it looked like. And he gave me some details on that. And then um, he described a number of sort of odd looking hovercraft and troop transporters and things that were you know, basically just, you know, kind of jazzed up, advanced uh, hover vehicles of one kind or another. And after going through all of this, I said, well, even this doesn't sound, you know, all that extraordinary. I mean, you know, is there something else? And he said, well, yeah, he says, uh, after they had the main little dog and pony show, they pulled back the curtain and there were these three flying saucers over there. I couldn't believe my ears. I said, oh, wait, did you say flying saucers? He said, yes. And I, and I said, well, what do they look like? He says, well, it, was just, it looked like something from the 1950s, like a jello bowl, flat on the bottom, sloping sides, a little terrace around the middle, and then a dome on the top with all these little bubbles around the top, and a door that looked like something off of a submarine, you know, with the little pins that go out into the frame of the door, and the big wheel that you turn to tighten it, all this kind of stuff. The smallest one was about 24 feet in diameter at the, at the bottom end of the craft. The um, medium-sized vehicle was uh, about 60 feet in diameter, and the largest was somewhere between 125 and 130 feet in diameter. I said, well, they, what were they doing? Were they just sitting on the floor? He says, no, they were hovering. They were, there wasn't a, you know, no landing gear, nothing holding them up, cables, it was just they were hovering. There was a three-star general that was part of the presentation. When they when they pulled back the curtains and these three things were these three flying saucers revealed to the audience that it that brought there to this hangar. Um, this uh, this general got up and he was describing these vehicles. He described them as uh, alien reproduction vehicles, ARV for short. Uh, they also had a nickname for the aircraft, they called them flux liners. Now flux is an electrical term for a, a high electrical charge, so high electrical charge liner, a flux liner. And so this was, you know, and so he got kind of scared, he stopped talking, and so I said, well, you know, let's, let's have lunch, you know, and he was nervous about talking about it on the phone, so I go over there and uh, we start talking, and as he's describing this stuff, he's describing the different features that he had seen. And well, how do you know that? I mean, if you could just look at the outside of the vehicle, how do you know what the inner workings is? He says, well, they had taken some of the panels off the outside so you could see the inside of, you know, what the components look like. And he said it was remarkably simple. There wasn't that much to it. And I said, and you were able to figure out how it worked from that? He said, well, no, they had a they had an easel next to it with a drawing, a cutaway drawing, that, uh, that showed some of the internal components, how they were arranged with and oriented to one another. And then they had a little uh, a TV monitor with uh, you know a, a tape player below it that was showing this you know continuous loop of this thing um, you know sitting you know or hovering over a like a dry lake bed out in the desert somewhere and and as as you would watch the tape this thing would make uh, from went from a hovering position made these three little sort of hops going to the side and then as the camera followed it, it just went 
straight up and disappeared out of sight. He just whoop, down to nothing in just a matter of a second and a half or so. One of the things that this general had said during the presentation, one of the things that really stood out in Brad's mind was that he said that these vehicles were capable of light speed or better. The aircraft looked very old, like it had been around for decades. It had chips in the paint and runs, and you could see fingerprints and smudges, and you know, boot prints where somebody had walked up the side of it, this kind of thing. And he said that uh, the, the paint that was on the outside, it looked like they'd taken a bunch of powdered lead, mixed it into a resin, and then just brush painted it right on the side of the aircraft. It was, looked like it was slapped together in somebody's garage, you know. So according to his account, on November 12th, 1988, Mark's friend inadvertently gained access to a highly classified air show where the featured hardware of the event was real flying saucers. They were really strange looking, but appeared functional and were named to suggest anti-gravity and reverse engineered alien technology. An official presence stated they could travel faster than light. Despite their futuristic performance capabilities, these appeared to be stripped-down, road-worn working prototypes, which had seen practical operation for years. If this were the case, they were crude but tangible proof of concept for a staggering leap in aviation technology. They used extremely advanced electromagnetic or field propulsion, as opposed to solid or jet fuel, nuclear power, or any other commonly known conventional means. It also meant our government and at least one other major defense contractor, Lockheed Martin, had been developing and deploying functional systems along these lines for many years. To both McCandlish and Brad, who had been working professionally for some time within what they thought were the highest levels of aeronautical design, this odd system was a sucker punch from the future. And apparently this had had a really, really serious impact on, on Brad, and he just, he, he really seemed kind of, you know, stunned by what he had seen. So I, you know, we got together for lunch, and I, I was doing all these idea sketches of what he described to me about how the components related, and I had, you know, your stereotypical sort of lens-shaped, you know, flying saucer like you see in, you know, more modern movies and stuff. And he said, oh, no, 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 this is real simple. It's flat on the bottom, sloping sides like, you know, a section taken out of a cone a little ledge and then a dome on the top. He said the dome is actually the top half of a crew compartment that's like a big ball. Pretty sure that was about 12 feet in diameter. Uh, there's a central column that goes down through the middle. There's like a flywheel thing on it that, uh, you know, maybe know, six to nine feet in diameter. There's four ejection seats that are all back to back on this central column above the flywheel type thing. And he says a bunch of oxygen tanks in there. They're all around the bottom. And uh, the, he said the bottom is this huge capacitor array. It's probably, I don't know, maybe 12 to 14 inches thick. Uh, it's shaved off at an angle on the edges. It looked like it had been put on a big, giant milling machine, and they milled off the edges at a 35-degree angle. He said there's a, a series of these plate capacitors. I said, well, do you think that this is functioning like the Beethoven brown effect, like, you know, these experiments were done back in the 60s with levitating things with, you know, electrostatic fields and stuff? He said, well, that may be it, but he says, they told me, he said, one of the things I saw was that it was using zero-point energy, it was using scalar energy. I said, really? It's cool, huh? Zero-point energy. You know, I, I save the best inventions for myself. Well, I've been corresponding with uh, Tom Bearden for about eight years at that point. We, you know, talked many times, mailed letters back and forth, talked on the phone and things. Okay, so what we have is we have a very strong argument that neither the scalar photon, that is the time polarized photon, nor the longitudinal photon, which is over in three space, are individually observable. But if you somehow can combine the two, they are observable as the instantaneous quantum potential. And so I had a sense of what zero point energy was about. And we want to talk about longitudinal waves and scalar waves and cyclotronic weapons and all this kind of stuff. And so I've been following this for a while, reading Tom Bearden's work and thing. And so I had a pretty good sense of what Brad was talking about, which he was a little surprised about that I would know this already. So he opened up to me a little bit more and began telling me more and more about it. When Brad finally came, became frustrated with my questions, he sat down, 
while we were in the office, his office together, and he did this rough sketch, which I still have to this day, you know, 22 years later. And he just sat down, and right where we were sitting there at his table, he just kind of sketched out in a, in a, with, a, with an ink pen on a piece of uh, legal size white paper and put some, you know, some little handwritten call outs around the edges that described, you know, the, the number of capacitor plates in each one of the little sections that there were, you know, they were so wide at the end and the crew compartment was definitely about 12 feet in diameter. Just kind of put all these things down as close as he could remember to the way they existed. And so I sat down with all this information and I just began sort of drafting it out. It was at this point Mark began putting his formidable skills as a conceptual illustrator to work in uncharted territory. Taking Brad's eyewitness account, detailed descriptions and rough sketches of the ARV, McCandlish began refining aspects of the components his friend described and piecing together an ever more precise rendition of the craft. Over the course of the next few years, he generated a series of drawings culminating in the Fluxliner Cutaway Blueprint, one of the most notorious images in the history of UFOlogy and the mysterious realm of black budget aircraft. I'm Jesse Ventura, and this is Conspiracy Theory. This was called the Fluxliner. This is probably the strangest one you've shown me yet. This actually flies? It actually flies on the principles of high voltage electrical charges. Uh, this is the, uh, the original, uh, one of the original blueprints of uh, the alien reproduction vehicle, which I produced in uh, March of 1989. Uh, it was uh, put together by uh, accumulating a lot of uh, uh, verbal testimony from Brad and later from a number of other sources, including Ken Snellen and some other people that I talked to who uh, had some contact or information about the vehicle. For Mark, his friend Brad's initial account was a fascinating story with a degree of veracity and plausibility, worth exploring and doing some research, but was after all just one man's tale of a fairly unbelievable event, concept and machine. However, this subsequent research led Mark to some other very compelling eyewitnesses, official documentation including numerous scientific patents and other sources such as respected quantum physicists, which finally convinced him of the likelihood that the ARV might be a very real thing. The first verification of uh, uh, the story that I picked up on the, uh, the alien reproduction vehicle was around 1991-1992 was the uh, first air show at Edwards Air Force Base where they actually had the B-2 stealth bomber on display. And in the course of that air show I had occasion to uh, join up with some clients from uh, Rockwell International and they introduced me to this fellow who claimed at the time that he was working with the Air Intelligence Agency, his name was Kent Sellen. He uh, claimed that he had inadvertently seen the same craft at Edwards Air Force Base North Base Facility in 1973. And I said, when, how, where, you know, what were the circumstances? He says, well, I, I was a crew chief. He said, I worked on Bill Scott's plane when he was a test pilot. And he says, one night my ship supervisor said to me, you know, go out to North Base. They've got a, a, a power unit out there, a ground power unit for an aircraft that's leaking or failed or something, so we need to take a tow vehicle out there, go out, pick it up, bring it back. Well, instead, what happened is he comes up off the dry lake bed, rolls right up on the tarmac, and is going down these rows of hangars. They're all Quonset-style hangars back then. And he stops in front of the first one with the doors cracked, expecting to find this defective ground power unit. And what does he see? He sees this flying saucer sitting in the hangar, hovering off the ground. So I, I tell him, so well, what happened? He says, well, this thing you know, was flat on the bottom, sloping. Sloping sides, a little ledge around there, and then a dome on the top with these little glass things on top. It looked like there was a camera under each one. And I said, really? He says, yeah. No, you know, no landing gear. It was hovering. And I said, let me borrow your pen. So I took out a Kodak lens cleaning tissue package that I had in my camera bag. It was the only thing I could think of to draw on. I just, I did a quick sketch of this alien reproduction vehicle as described by my friend Brad Sorensen back in 1988. And I said, is that what you saw? And he says, oh, you've seen one. 
And I said, no, I, I, but I wasn't sure until this moment that the story was absolutely true. And so that was when I knew there was a second point of confirmation. He says, I wasn't there for 15 seconds, and I heard footsteps running up to me. And before I could even turn around and look, he says, there was a machine gun barrel at my throat, another one over here, and he says, a gruff voice says, close your eyes and get on the ground or we're going to blow your head off. So they put a hood over his head, blindfolded him, hauled him off, and they spent 18 hours debriefing him. He was um, forced to sign some non-disclosure documents about that, but then was given some additional information about it, things, details about the ejection sequence for that vehicle and so forth, things that Brad didn't know anything about. So that gave some validity to what he was saying. In addition to Kent Sellen, there is at least one other witness on record testifying to the existence of what he describes as a UFO at Norton Air Force Base, which may well have been the ARV. I uh, can uh, discuss Norton Air Force Base and that uh, as a result of all the military air command bases under me for their your facilities, that uh, there was one facility at Norton Air Force Base that was close hold. Not even the, the wing commander there could know what was going on. And during that time period, uh, throughout my career, it was always rumored by the pilots that uh, that was a cover uh, for, in fact, a location of one uh, UFO craft. And the reason for that location was uh, folks that uh, could come out, land at Norton, play golf, uh, be part of a golf tournament, and so forth, and during that process could go by the facility and actually see the UFO. I became so excited about the prospect that this thing really was real and that there really was some technology about it. And uh, so every chance I got, I would strike up a conversation with someone I knew in the industry and I'd ask them if they'd ever heard anything about this. I was talking to a fellow by the name of Paul Shepard who was a UFO investigator. I felt that he'd have you know, a little bit more uh, knowledge about the kinds of things that were going on in this area of research. And he put me in touch with a couple of gentlemen, uh, Gordon Novell and George Ulick, who was a physicist with Hercules Aerospace up in Sandy, Utah. And they were very interested in this story. I started off uh, as an aeronautical engineer when I was in college, and I got real interested in what makes UFOs go. And, and so I just kind of pursued the trail of the technology as opposed to the aliens and that kind of stuff. And that's all I do is pursue the technology. And, I got lucky, got very, very lucky, and got my hands on a cutaway of their bird. Uh, one of them had an ongoing correspondence with uh, UFO researcher Wendell Stevens, a retired lieutenant colonel from the Air Force, um, who had participated in sort of these UFO chasing exercises up around the Arctic many, many years ago. So um, Gordon sent a request off to Wendell Stevens saying, you know, we know we have, that you have this big photo archive of all these different UFOs that have been seen over the years. Do you have any photography that even resembles what we're describing in, in this drawing that I had done? And it turned out that there was a case. I obtained uh, photographs that were uh, taken in 1967 by a military pilot, Harvey Williams, flying a C-47 for the Air Force at 12,000 feet, approximately 25 miles southwest of Provo, Utah. Uh, this particular vehicle matches the so-called ARV uh, in all proportions and respects in terms of the detail of the shape of the craft. It, it really uh, bore a striking resemblance to the ARV with, with one possible exception, and that was that the synthetic vision system, little bubbles that accommodated the camera systems on the outside of the thing were quite a bit larger than the ones that Brad had re reported. And so when I thought back to something that Brad had said, and that was that many of the components on the ARV, like the ejection seats and the camera systems, uh, were all off-the-shelf components. He said that the, uh, the ones that he saw in 1988 uh, look just like the the little bubbles you see hanging from the ceiling in the casinos in Las Vegas. So when I thought back to the camera systems that were available in 1966, of course they were much larger than they were in 1988, and so the larger acrylic bubbles seemed, you know, to uh, give some veracity to the photography as it was presented in these these pictures taken by Harvey Williams. 
One of the things that came up in the investigation was the fact that um, a number of the witnesses starting in 1988 described the vehicle that they saw as looking like it had been around for a long time. Chips in the paint, you know, fingerprints, you know, greasy handprints and that kind of stuff. The, uh, the material around where the Zeus fasteners brought the panels together all chipped and scratched and stuff like it had been around for a long time. When I uh, talked in 1991 or 92 to Kent Sullen, uh, you know, he clarified that he'd seen this thing in 1973, which was, you know, what, 15 years or something earlier than that. And then the photographs from Wendell Stevens showed that this thing may have been operational as early as, you know, June or July of 1966. So it certainly supported the idea that this thing had been around for quite a while, maybe even uh, earlier than that. When you look at some of the photography uh, of UFOs, going all the way back to some of the earliest photography we know of, McMinnville, Oregon, for example, you see the same general layout, you see the same general configuration, the flat bottom, the sloping sides, a little dome in the middle, sometimes pointy, sometimes almost like the top end of a cylinder that's been chopped off, sometimes a perfectly round dome, sometimes even, you know, like a cone on the top. So it suggests that, you know, there's, there's, um, uh, many different variants of the system, but the overall arrangement of the components is basically the same. I kept saying to myself, you know, this is just too much of a coincidence. You know, maybe, maybe this goes back a lot further than anybody knows. In fact, in a translation of a Sanskrit text written by a Middle Eastern king in the 11th century, there are references to Vimanas, or flying machines, with a propulsion system bearing a striking resemblance to that of the ALV. Strong and durable must the body of Vimana be made, like a great flying bird of light material. Inside, one must put the mercury engine with its iron heating apparatus underneath. By means of the power latent in the mercury which sets the driving whirlwind in motion, a man sitting inside may travel a great distance in the sky. One of the things that they describe when you, you read up on the literature surrounding these so-called Vimanas was the so-called mercury vortex or mercury turbine engine. I see the word Vimana. Can you describe how that relates? Well, this, this is something that uh, I, you know, I spent a lot of time reading up about uh, the so-called mercury turbine generators or vortex, mercury vortex, vortex generators uh, described in you know, some of these ancient uh, Sumerian texts. And so I, I started looking at the possibility that there had to be some kind of circulation going on in the mercury itself. So that was the, the kind of thing that I visualized would be going on inside the chamber. The uh, central column has a number of components, a couple of counter-rotating cylinders. It sounds very much like the device that uh, the Nazis were developing in the Wenceslas mine in Poland towards the end of the Second World War. There seems to be some evidence that they were trying to develop some kind of an anti-gravity propulsion system or a zero-point energy device. Apparently, if we're talking about systems using components and processes similar to the ARV, we can't ignore the Nazis. I think it was Timothy Good um, published a story, uh, uh, maybe above top secret, where he found a researcher who was following developments by the Nazis at the end of the Second World War, and it looked like they'd been developing flying saucers up in Poland in the Lancelis Mine, and they had this this thing that looked like Stonehenge, where they had all these high voltage cables coming into it and these chains that would hold something down and they had this thing called the bell, the Dusklocka. The Glocka. The bell. That uh, was in, down in this mine in Wenceslas and that it involved a ceramic dome 
and it had two cylinders inside with a mercury solution circulating in. The two cylinders were inside an electromagnetic field, and they were counter-rotating, and they had this mixture of uh, mercury, thorium, and beryllium. Now, it looks like there's a high-voltage electrical discharge that's being sent through the mercury, and that is somehow doing something that enables this anti-gravity effect to occur. Besides rumors about Hitler's top scientists and the mythology of ancient kings, there were other instances where a central core involving mercury and other components similar to the ARV were reported. At one point, Mark contacted and interviewed possible UFO abductees to gain insight on the technology they may have seen in the alien craft something he had in common with McDonnell Douglas in the 1960s and possibly numerous other corporate and government entities since the 1940s. I wound up going to my management and telling them, you know, you're not going to believe this, but the UFOs are clearly coming from someplace else. They clearly manned or humanoided. And the only question is whether we're going to figure out how they work before Lockheed or after. And so, as a result of that, the company at that time, which has now, of course, been bought by Boeing, over several years put in about $500,000 worth of research effort under my direction to study gravity control techniques and uh, also analyze UFOs. We hired uh, some, a police detective to interview witnesses, abductees. We had experimental work and theoretical work. So it was kind of a fun project. In the course of all this, it occurred to me that one of the other resources that I might be able to draw on was people in the alien abduction community. I began to think, you know, well, these people are either crazy or they're really having an experience of some kind. And, and some of them even talked about implants that were being recovered from their bodies. And so I was intrigued and I thought, well, okay, you know, if any of these stories are true, there might be a chance, however slim, that if they really were abducted by aliens, they might have gotten a tour of the ship. They might have seen some propulsion system components. And so uh, I heard three of these young ladies being interviewed on a radio station out of Las Vegas. This was sort of the precursor to Art Bell and Coast to Coast AM. It was the Billy Goodman happening. And he was interviewing uh, City of Otomos, uh, Melinda Leslie, and Alicia Davis. Contacted the station. They put me in touch with these three young ladies. I interviewed them individually, and much to my surprise, determined that these young ladies uh, seem to be bona fide examples of the phenomena with implants that uh, could be seen on medical uh, MRIs. So what I did was I simply asked them to describe what they saw and without disclosing anything that I already knew about the components inside the alien reproduction vehicle, I found that these young ladies, at least one of them in particular, was able to describe not only components that strongly resembled the ones that were inside the alien reproduction vehicle, but they were also at a higher level of sophistication that actually gave additional clues about how the ARV pro actually functioned. Alicia Davis had described being escorted into the engine room and seeing the propulsion system components, and it involved a central column that was made of a transparent glass-like material, and she said there was a silvery fluid that was spiraling upward in this, in the, at the bottom of this column, down in kind of this well that was in the center of the spacecraft was this little tiny flywheel-like mechanism spinning, which matched the ARV also. And this is at a point when this young lady had never seen any of the drawings that I'd done of what the ARV was structured like. I was just you know, talking about propulsion components in general. But then she said that when you looked across this little uh, well, you know, this lowered floor area in the center of the room was like a guardrail around and she stood there. She said, you could look across and she said it looked like that below the deck she was standing on was this glass-like material with these coils of wire going through it. And they were spaced out in the same proportions as the ones on the ARV. The thing that she said that was most significant was that the column itself was rotating in one direction and the flywheel was opposite, spinning in the opposite direction. So there was counter-rotation which is something that's often been reported in UFO sightings. You see components on the craft that are spinning in opposite directions. Back here on Earth, the scientific community has been busy since the end of the Industrial Revolution. 
There have been dozens, perhaps hundreds of US and international patents dealing directly with electrokinetics and electrogravitics going back to the turn of the last century. It would be safe to assume private industry and the military have also been working on a great deal of related applications off the public record. In short, since Nikola Tesla's first experiments with pushing electricity around, mankind has had a thing for anti-gravity. If you look at these two illustrations, this is a patent that was secured in May of uh, May 30th, 1967, by uh, James Frank King, Jr., who happened to work with uh, Thomas Townsend Brown in the uh, labs of Agnew Bonson. But you can see a striking similarity between the uh, the two uh, vehicles. Uh, on the one hand, you've got uh, uh, a, a sort of uh, uh, a frustrum-shaped uh, uh, fuselage section. You've got a series of coils that wrap around the crew compartment, although the crew compartment in this instance is more of a cylinder. But you also have a central column that goes down through the middle, and you have this capacitor section that's in the bottom. And then you have these little flight control mechanisms here. You know, it's, it's, I find it really remarkable that there's so much similarity between the two objects. Mm -hmm. And when that when is that patent from? Um, May 30, 1967. It's called a magnetohydrodynamic propulsion apparatus. And so I started thinking, well, maybe it's like a cyclotron. Maybe there's an electrical discharge from this. Basically, this this whole thing looks like a giant Tesla coil. It's got the capacitor array. It's got you know a central column that looks like the secondary windings of a Tesla coil. And th this might even go back to something that Nikola Tesla discovered back in the 1940s. And, you know, it just was all hushed up and all the UFO sightings we've ever seen were something that came from Nikola Tesla and not from another planet. And I mean, th these are the things that were all going through my head at the time. So it was, it was um, uh, really surprising um, to find all the different sources that I encountered that seem to provide useful information as to how this thing was made, how it worked, what its energy sources were. And it just, it was all really fascinating to me and that's one of the reasons I pursued it. It wasn't because I was, you know, like I say, trying to breach national security. I was just insatiably curious about how these things work. And he said it was remarkably simple. There wasn't that much to it. The ARV system, for all of its claims of flashy, out-of-this-world propulsion capabilities, was indeed remarkably simple. It could be described as a large-scale, souped-up Tesla coil, designed to negate gravity and inertia, with off-the-shelf navigation and life support systems bolted on, almost as an afterthought. You could think of it as the Model T of anti-gravity vehicles, an industrial dune buggy, or crude hot rod that can get you to Mars in a few minutes. In this version at least, first class seating was still a way off. From everything I've been able to gather, um, it, it helps to understand what some of the components are. There's a, a large capacitor array on the bottom of the craft. It's um, in the smallest version, it's 24 feet in diameter. The outer edge of the plates and the capacitor section itself, they're shaved off at that same 35 degree angle. So you have a series of plates that are progressively smaller as you get higher and higher in the stack. And there's 48 sections that are all set up like that. Through the middle of the crew compartment is a central column uh, that's called the amplifier section that's in the middle of the craft. On the very center point of that column is what looks like a large nine foot diameter flywheel type mechanism. Then around the belt line of the, uh, the crew compartment is a uh, about a two foot wide coil of wire that's embedded in the same glass like material that the capacitor section plates are embedded in. And there's a, a kind of flange or fairing that traps 
the top and the bottom surfaces of the coil. You can see that it traps it there and at the top. But in between are a series of explosive bolts that run all the way around the craft. And they said above this ledge there is a, uh, uh, looks like a, a door out of, you know, your stereotypical cartoon submarine. You know, it has a steel frame that's embedded in the side of this pultruded sphere that makes up the crew compartment. And he said and it had a, a wheel on it with little spokes that you would turn like an old, you know, Captain Nemo submarine with the pins that would go out and lock into the door frame. And it had a seal on it so it would be airtight. And then the ejection seats are mounted back to back. There's four of them in the smallest version of the craft. And they're mounted on this central column on a set of rails. And in the event of an ejection, the explosive bolts separate the top and the bottom halves of the crew compartment. And the entire outer sheath of the uh, central column pulls away uh, along with the upper half of the crew compartment and the ejection seats. This uh, crew compartment sphere can actually function as kind of a rudimentary re-entry vehicle coming down through the atmosphere and then once you get say below 14, 15, 16,000 feet uh, the thing will pop a chute out the top and uh, the ejection seats drop off on these rails one by one and the pilot can drift down uh, in a parachute or with a parachute. Because this flywheel-like mechanism is turning all the time, uh, the individual um, pilot or crew members have a, a kind of a pan that's uh, right below the front of the ejection seat that uh, affords them a place to uh, put their feet. Now the control system on the vehicle, um, uh, on the ejection seat that uh, the pilot sits in, on the one hand it looks like a, uh, a, high, a high voltage uh, potentiometer or like a rheostat on the one side that has a couple of big heavy duty cables that come out of it and goes into the central column and that's basically the amount of power that he has in the system. And on the other side, there was sort of a, uh, uh, an inverted J-shaped piece of metal that came up and over like that that had a sphere on it. Now on the bottom of the sphere, there is a sort of a bowl that's sort of slightly larger in diameter, but it conforms to the shape of this sphere. Of all the components of the ARV, the navigation system, while perfectly logical and even elegant in its design, has to be the strangest one. It's an entirely unknown paradigm in steering an aircraft or anything else, yet makes perfect technical sense. If one were to make the case for truly alien aspects of the alien reproduction vehicle, this might be the first example they'd use. The sphere itself appears to be... Um a uh, kind of a domed arrangement where you have a number of fiber optic uh, leads that come into the, uh, the sphere and for each one of the 48 capacitor arrays there's a series of sensors that are then used to sort of relay information to the individual plates. And so then on the bottom of this you have a, uh, a bowl that, that moves around and can be you know used to uh, convey uh, the, the commands of the pilot in terms of what he wants to do in, sh in terms of shaping the field around the vehicle. And right in the center of that bowl is a kind of uh, uh, laser diode that sends a laser beam up into the, the underside, the inside of this sphere. And so as the bowl moves, that laser is sort of scanning around on the inside of the different sensors that are responsible for each of the capacitor sections then will you know there's a series of relays that will open up and close and let a certain amount of energy in or you know prevent it from going in and when it's dead center it means that all of them get the exact same amount of information you just go straight up if you want to bank to the right then you uh, you turn you bank this to the right it sends uh, you know these the, the uh, laser signal over to the opposite side of the dome and it says that the opposite side of the craft is going to get more energy so it banks in that direction it's kind of like in a, uh, a helicopter, in the swash plate of a helicopter, when you want to bank to the left, you create more deflection in the, uh, the main rotor on the right side so that it begins to bank to the right, or bank to the left, excuse me. So it's kind of the same principle. Then you have an oxygen supply that's uh, strapped to the lower part of the central column down here in the lower part of the crew compartment. You have uh, a much larger set of oxygen tanks, and these are all protruded uh, vessels, by the way. There's no steel or aluminum in terms of the oxygen supply uh, in the vehicle. There was also a pair of oxygen tanks under the seat 
uh, and that was assuming that maybe you had to eject, you know, when you were 25 or 30,000 feet and you needed some air to get you from up there down to the place where you'd actually be able to breathe ambient air. I said, well, were there windows? And no, there weren't any windows. He said there was a thing called a synthetic vision system. And he said there were uh, six or seven of these, these little plastic bubbles around the top of this thing, one on the very top in the center, and then maybe six around uh, about halfway up from where the ledge was to the very top, and they were spaced at even distances. And he said in each one there was a little CCD camera. So the synthetic vision system was set up so they would take two cameras and it would have a converging point of focus in those two cameras so that it would just be like looking through a set of binoculars. So you have a left and a right eye view and it'd give you a three-dimensional view outside the vehicle but with no windows. And the reason for that apparently was that this aircraft was using extremely high voltages and the voltages would ionize the air around the vehicle so much that it would start producing x-ray photons which are absolutely lethal so you have to have basically a barrier to protect yourself. You also have a, a robotic arm that seems to be uh, blended in with a composite fairing uh, sitting right on the top surface of the uh, capacitor array uh, that has the ability to extend outward with a little uh, uh, air driven claw that's on the end of it. In fact, uh, I think that uh, the craft's magnetic field or electromagnetic field is probably so powerful that conventional little electric motors probably wouldn't work in this kind of an application. Where they took the panels off the side of the aircraft is that they had Zeus fasteners that were these little like quick spin lock things that they put on there to hold the panels. The panels are all like a fiberglass material, it's all composite. The entire vehicle appeared to be covered with what he's referred to as a goopy lead paint. It looked like little flecks of lead that had been suspended in kind of a resin and just painted haphazardly over the outside of everything on the vehicle with the possible exception of the door itself and these little blisters that house the uh, synthetic vision system. So why would it be goopy lead paint? Well, the, the theory is that uh, the electrostatic field created by this huge capacitor array uh, and the ionization that occurs just because of the propulsion system might be enough to create uh, a level of ionization around the craft that's high enough that it would produce X-ray photons of its own accord. And so you would want to be able to protect the, the pilot and the, uh, the crew members from that radiation. So anyway, that's the, uh, the general overview of the, uh, the structure of the vehicle. This is a, a vehicle that has the ability to travel up to or beyond the speed of light. And part of the reason that it's able to do that is because it exploits the energy form that's embedded in space-time that's responsible for the effects of mass and inertia. So here we have a configuration of various components, creating a system that's somehow capable of producing and maintaining an insane amount of energy in a concentrated field around the vehicle. This field can be precisely controlled by the pilot with the aid of a basic throttle, an alien steering ball, and a bunch of casino cameras. There's plenty of onboard oxygen, handy if you're off the planet, and a lead coating so the occupants don't get fried in their seats. And a robot arm, in case you need a robot arm somewhere. It looks like a big clumsy diving bell from 1905, but apparently works like a helicopter you can take past light speed. Its beauty and elegance lie in the propulsion system, maybe a really, really fast one that gets around currently accepted physics, one we commonly associate with UFOs. For anybody who has followed the work of Einstein or just basic physics, you know, one of the sort of um, you know, inviolable rules of physics is that there's no material object that can actually go faster than the speed of light. So somehow or other, and I'm not saying we got this from aliens, but they did call it the alien reproduction vehicle, but somehow or other, this simple system that Brad described in these diagrams was able to do this. So I, you know, I began uh, looking at the scientific literature. I was looking at uh, this scalar energy, anything I could find on zero-point energy, scalar energy, quantum zero-point fluctuations of the vacuum, I think is the more technical physics term that they use in the literature. And it turned out that there really were scientific papers that were being published by a number of different scientists, uh, Hal Putoff, Bernard Heche, Alfonso Rieda, uh, who just happened to work at Lockheed Skunk Works, by the way. 
Yeah, so I started I started noticing the names and where they worked and what they do, and what they were talking, what they're publishing. And it occurred to me that, you know, maybe these are people who have some insider. So I started looking at that. I started looking at the things that Hal Putoff had said. In the middle of last century, um, physicists made an astounding uh, uh, discovery. And that is what we ordinarily consider empty space isn't empty at all. Even if you go to the far reaches of outer space, it turns out that rather than emptiness, what we call the vacuum <clears throat> is really a seething cauldron of what we call quantum energy or zero-point energy. Zero-point just simply means that even if you froze the entire universe down to absolute zero, froze out all motion where everything would be as quiet as you could possibly get it, this energy is still there. It was predicted uh, by the mathematics of quantum theory, <clears throat> but the numbers were so large. For example, there's enough energy in the volume of a coffee cup to evaporate the world's oceans. It was thought, well, this must be some kind of artifact in the theory. But as time went on, uh, various predictions in quantum theory um, were verified in the laboratory, and it finally turned out we had to take these numbers seriously. So I. Um I uh, opened up a correspondence with Hal Putoff, and he was very gracious in taking time to talk to me on the phone, send me copies of the, uh, the peer-reviewed papers that he had published in you know physics review, physics A, physics B, and and uh, you know I couldn't I couldn't understand the mathematics with all these Greek symbols, and I mean it was it was really advanced theoretical stuff, and. But what I was able to follow were the paragraphs that were before and after the equations that explained what all the math was talking about. And so as I went through these papers and I would, I would talk to Hal, he would explain to me, well, this, this means that this is a certain process, a polarization process that happens in the vacuum of space-time. And when you do that, you have this kind of phenomenon. When you do that, you have this other phenomenon. And the papers that he wrote started to indicate the zero-point energy that's embedded in the environment was responsible for the effects of inertia and gravity and mass and the reason why as you accelerate through space-time the mass of your vehicle increases. So in a sense if you find the right way to do it you can actually sort of reduce the mass of an object and if you can do that then of course it takes less propulsive force to push it around. It means that it can go a lot faster because it's not limited by the amount of mass that it increases to as it accelerates. In fact, it may in fact be a situation where uh, the faster you go, the more energy you have available to continue, uh, continue the acceleration process and at the same time the mass is becoming relatively less and less and less. So it really it really enables the possibility of being able to go faster in speed of light without violating general relativity. And that was the most fascinating aspect of the whole thing. You're drawing energy from the environment, and in the process of doing that, you're enabling the craft to not only uh, demass itself, but use, uh, basically conserve energy by using the flux in the vacuum.